A child is like a house plant. Everyone seems to want to have one these days, but keeping them alive is an exhaustive full-time job. Then there's a point where people judge you based on the outlook of your plant. Leaves too dry, bad mom. Plant too short, bad mom. Roots not deep enough, bad mom. In a way, they do have a right to judge, since house plants are a huge responsibility and one which we commit to voluntarily. Okay, let's replace the word plant with child. Like house plants, it's our responsibility to nurture our children. And if it is that they aren't thriving, we need to do a deep dive into the problem or maybe a deep dive into ourselves. According to the US Department of Health, 15 to 20% of any population falls on the spectrum of dyslexia. That translates to about one in five people. So in this room, where we may have 100 people, it's likely 20 of us are going to fall on the, dis on the spectrum of dyslexia. Additionally, 75 to 85% of children who are admitted to special education classes for learning disabilities have dyslexia. That's a lot of parents with a lot of dyslexic children. I am one of those parents. You see, I'm a proud West Indian from two tiny little islands in the Caribbean called Trinidad and Tobago. Now, growing up in West Indian culture, it's not unusual for your parents to ask you to do some sort of revision on a commute to school. Whether it is you practice your timetables, you look at your spelling, or you do some reading in preparation for the day ahead. One essential part of these sessions is that it's often accompanied by sharp looks and even sharper comments from your parents in the unfortunate event that you got something wrong. In my case, it was presided over by a dabbler. And if you know what a dabbler is, it's a long wooden cooking utensil used to flip roti on a tower. But the fantastic thing about a dabbler is that it was an excellent correction tool. And due to its length, it could reach from the front seat where your parents were sitting to the back seat again in the unfortunate event that you got something wrong. But that's West Indian culture, right? But I could, hear, I could still hear my mother now while she was driving. Child, don't make me stop this car. In what world is five sixes 56? And for my brother, who had some early challenges with phonics, often confused fury and furry. And she would say, for the umpteen time, a man cannot be filled with furry. And bam, there came the dabbler from the front seat to the back seat. Again, that's West Indian culture for you. I mean, we turned out well, if I don't say so myself. And I think my parents' West Indian style of parenting contributed significantly significantly to our cognitive and behavioral development. Beyond that, the commute was precious bonding time. And beyond the sharp looks and the sharp comments, it was an unmistakable reflection of love. She wanted us to succeed. Like most cultural traditions that are handed down from generation to generation, my daughter did not escape the commuting ritual. Probably, perhaps, with a lot less dabbler usage, but nonetheless, she went through this. Being a young black woman with dyslexia and the level of misunderstanding that still exists in the community, I worried about her. Not only does she have to contend with the stereotypes of being black, but she now has to contend with the stereotypes of being a person with a learning disability. That made me recoil even further into my willing misunderstanding of what dyslexia really is. A growing body of research suggests that good parenting skills, coupled with a supportive home learning environment, are positively related to a child's development. 
Based on my experience with my parents and my experience as a parent, I knew I had a lot of thinking to do. Dyslexia is most commonly understood on a symptomatic basis, meaning that kids might jumble their words or they might mistake Bs for Ds. But it's much deeper than this. According to the British Dyslexic Association, dyslexia is about the brain's inability to process information that they hear and see. As a result, people with dyslexia have problems in learning, as well as the acquisition of literacy and organizational skills in a traditional context. It took me 12 years of her life to realize that she had dyslexia. Probably 12 years of suffering where suffering was not necessary. But I've come a long way on my journey, and I want to share with you what I have learned and the mistakes I've made in the hope of changing the perception that parents may have of their dyslexic children. One of the most important hurdles in my journey was getting over myself. Your child's disability is not about you. As a matter of fact, at the core, it's 10% about you and 90% about the child. However, your ability to detect that there is a problem, accept it, and do something about it is 90% about you and 10% about the child. Here's what I'll tell you. Like any other change or realization in life, acceptance will take time. I liken it to the five stages of grief. You would likely go through denial, anger, bargaining, and that last elusive stage of acceptance. It is at that stage that you have the ability to recognize that something is wrong and move forward. Secondly, a deeper understanding of neurodiversity made me realize that we are all different. We all truly are. Neurodiversity does not imply an inferior mental capacity, but rather a different one. Scientific evidence confirms that some children are born with brains that think, operate, and process information differently. Neurological differences may be considered a disability, but it is most certainly not a flaw. And it most certainly doesn't diminish a person's personhood. So the essence of this conversation is not about uh, your ability to manage or cope with your child's diversity, neurodiversity, but your ability to accept it and understand it, knowing that you cannot change it. My daughter may not be comparatively good in English or biology, but she most certainly has her niche. She's great at drawing, something that many of us can't even wrap our heads around, including myself. Maybe, just maybe, she may be the next Bansky. Who knows? But I'm most certainly sticking around to find out. Not because that it only brings us some measure of happiness and fulfillment, but due to the fact that it might be a good retirement plan for my husband and I. Who knows? The point that I'm trying to hammer home is, it is your responsibility as a parent to help your child find that niche and nurture it. The third and final area I would like to leave with you is the journey of true understanding. Swiss psychologist Carl Jung once said, you cannot change anything until you accept it. Condemnation does not liberate, it oppresses. If it is that your child told you that they had the ability to fly, won't you be the least bit curious in terms of how high they can go? Dyslexia is a superpower, and understanding it means learning about it, educating yourself, and getting involved. I'll tell you a little story. About one year ago, my daughter had to choose subjects that she'll be doing at the GCSE level because she goes to a school that follows Brit the British curriculum. 
she came home one day and said, Ma, I want to do art. I said, art? I said, OK, well, if that's your decision, go right ahead. But once she was out of my earshot, I called my brother, Mr. Fury and Fury. And I asked him, or I told him, she wants to do art. And his response was, art? Where is she going with art? What job is she going to get with art? We're going to have to mine her for the rest of our lives. Fast forward one year to today. I have a Bansky on my hands. The point that I'm trying to make is let them be who they want to be through their eyes, not who you want them to be through your eyes. This leaves me with the what you can do part. Well, there is some measure of elitism that still occurs in the choices that children make. That still happens in the Caribbean and all over the world. But it is your responsibility to protect your children from those worldviews and let them be who they want to be. The world has been blessed with many great people living with dyslexia. Whoopi Goldberg, Octavia Spencer, journalist Anderson Cooper, and the late great boxing world champion Muhammad Ali, who, by the way, was a brilliant wordsmith. When I think about some of the greats in the Caribbean, Jamaica's Usain Bolt, fastest man in the world, Trinidad and Tobago's Brian Lara, world record holding cricketer, Mia Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados, first female Prime Minister of Barbados. Their backstories are all the same. They had some measure of a nurturing home environment in which they could have honed their skills and talents. When it is that we think about your child, they could be the next great CEO, journalist, playwright, writer, but it depends on the type of environment that you cultivate at home that will too allow them to nurture and hone their skills. So my parting question to you is, are you a safe space for your neurodiverse child? After all, is it true that home is the starting place of love, hope, and dreams? Thank you.